so my name is Anton, and uh, since we don't have uh, a lot of people here, you can freely ask questions and interrupt me anytime you like. I'm a little bit afraid that my talk will span more than 45 minutes, so uh, uh, don't hesitate to ask. Uh, today I will tell about rolling updates. Uh, why is it important to pay attention to not disturbing your client's application when you are refreshing the version of the database? Uh, during the last six years, I was working with uh, YDB. It's a distributed SQL database. It's uh, an open source project now. And our main uh, project is to provide managed services for clients who want to migrate their workload from Cassandra clusters or from sharded uh, Postgres or MySQL uh, installations to a distributed SQL managed database. In uh, 2022, since I work as a project manager, in 2022 I was involved in this open source project. It was pretty hard to persuade our management to open source the product that was developed internally, but we managed to do this. Uh, it was very interesting. Uh, then I was involved in launching the first serverless database service, which uh, is available in uh, cloud providers in uh, Russia. Uh, you can use pay-as-you-go model and pay for requests uh, and not for the time the database is working. And in 2018, I was managing the project to make this uh, database available internally as a managed service inside our company, so developers from different departments didn't have to manage uh, operating systems and database installations. They could just click on a web interface to launch their database cluster. And uh, today I will describe a little bit about YDB, what this system is all about. I will tell about its layered architecture. Then we will uh, talk a little bit about rolling updates, why, why we need rolling updates and why they are different from another types of updates. Then I will show which types of availability uh, failures might occur when you uh, refresh the version of the database cluster. And we will understand how YDB and its layered architecture helps to handle all these failures and not to cause a lot of um, errors during the rolling update. So what's YDB? It's a distributed SQL database. Uh, have anyone ever tried distributed SQL? Oh, wow. Uh, uh, <laughs> looks uh, unexpected. So it's a system that you use when you need transactions and when you need to scale horizontally uh, your uh, load when you cannot uh, put all your uh, transactions into one PostgreSQL server because you do not have enough uh, CPU capacity. There are different uh, systems on the market, and YDB is one of uh, maybe two or three open source distributed SQL databases, which are released under Apache 2 license, so we don't have any um, restrictions on using the system uh, from uh, GitHub. Um, it uh, scales horizontally. It automatically recovers after hardware failure, so when a hard drive fails, uh, you do not have to do any administration beyond uh, ejecting the failed hard drive and replacing it with a new one. Um, it automatically scales under the load, so you can just add compute power to uh, handle the increasing requests. And we uh, think that this database suits when it's uh, when your application is mission critical and should be available 24-7. These slides uh, will cause tablets. I'm going to talk about tablets. It's going to be uh, complex. Uh, developers, since it's a distributed SQL database, developers operate tables. So they write SQL queries. Uh, they create tables with rows and columns. Every table has a primary key, which might be comprised of several columns. Uh, and every column has a data type. Or you can put JSON, if you like, in a, in a, in a column, if you have some unstructured data. Um, but in order to handle a lot of load, we need to uh, introduce partitioning. So every table, uh, when it's created, is served by one partition. Partition is represented in the system by a tablet. Tablet is an instance of C++ uh, class, which runs somewhere on a cluster, on, every, on any compute node. And the guarantees of the tablet are following. A tablet is always running in a single instance, so all the machinery of the system guarantees that there is only one instance of a tablet uh, representing one partition in a cluster. And the tablet uh, talks to 
distributed storage we will discuss a little bit uh, further. Uh, we have simple API. A tablet sends requests to write a blob and to read the blob, and tablet doesn't care about the copies of the data. Uh, so tablets also can uh, split automatically. If a tablet gets too uh, large, uh, it splits automatically into two tablets, and the developer doesn't have to know anything about the structure of the table underneath. So it might be represented by hundreds of tablets. Every tablet is responsible for a key range, and only this uh, tablet can read or write data uh, uh, in this key range. Uh, and if one tablet gets too overloaded, it can't handle all the requests. A, table is, um, a tablet is uh, single-threaded, so it has a limit on the number of requests it can handle per second. When it consumes uh, more than the designated amount of CPU resources, it decides to split to handle all the load. Of course, it won't help you if you have one overloaded key, but uh, if you avoid overloaded keys, automatic splits and merges uh, do uh, the trick with horizontal scalability. Uh, why we need to update databases? Because we release new software pretty often, we have some roadmaps, some features to deliver, and uh, when you operate databases on premises, when you're running your PostgreSQL cluster, you might update it once a year. I did this in my uh, previous experience, it works okay. But we have to deliver new features, we need to run fast, and we need to do rolling updates uh, every week. Uh, so what are the usual approaches to an update, which I used when I was responsible for one database server? You can simply switch off the node, when there is no load, you can negotiate a maintenance window during the night, you shut down the server, application is not working, then you restart the server back, and uh, it works normally. If you have a cluster, uh, which uh, allows you to scale the load, you can do the same trick to the cluster, but it will uh, also have uh, complete unavailability during this update. So all the nodes are down, when they are restarted back with a new version, if you are lucky and everything works perfectly, you are uh, alive. <coughs> but some kinds of uh, applications, for instance, ride sharing or um, food delivery services, they have to be available 24 seven and you cannot allow them to experience downtimes like that. You cannot negotiate um, maintenance window with a banking application. So people uh, using rolling update technique for years it's the pretty simple approach when you have to make sure that the newer version and the old version can work together, they are compatible, and then you can just restart nodes of the cluster one by one with the newer version. When you switch off the node, uh, application gets some uh, amount of errors, then they reestablish connections to another nodes of the cluster and continue operating as normally. The newer version of the uh, server returns and Everything is okay, you have one uh, node running a new version, so you just proceed with all the nodes of the cluster and now you are okay. But um, this approach uh, has some challenges. First, you need to provide read and write availability, so you cannot switch too many nodes of the cluster. Uh, then you need to decrease the amount of errors your application receives because you cannot switch one third of a cluster, get uh, 30% uh, of 500 responses and think that it's okay. Uh, people trying to find a taxi will get angry. And uh, you need to minimize latency degradation because people who are trying to send their money to your uh, application uh, and seeing, seeing this spinner will also get angry so you don't have to uh, increase the latency. Otherwise, your customers will complain. Our customers, when we didn't have the techniques I'm gonna talk about, were complaining all the time because they are monitoring their uh, latencies. So, we have identified it, the challenges, and now let me describe YDB and uh, the architecture of the system, how it helps. So it has three layers. First layer is a storage. It's a distributed uh, storage, which is comprised of YDB processes, run on a bare metal service. They could run on virtual machines, but basically we run them on bare metal uh, service. And we attach storage devices, physical storage devices, to this bare metal machine. It might be a hard disk drive or an NVMe or any, anything you like, any, any block device. Uh, and uh, designate these storage devices to this storage process. 
So you have a set of uh, bare metal servers with storage devices attached. You run YDB processes on every machine. They connect to each other and form a storage cluster and an internal cluster network, which is accessible by compute layer. Compute layer is uh, comprised of YDB processes, which uh, has uh, no need to know anything about the distribution of the data on storage devices, anything like this. You can just run a YDB process in a virtual machine, tell it the address of the storage cluster, and the name of the database is going to serve. Storage layer is responsible for handling queries. It uh, processes SQL queries and uh, uh, does all the computations. So applications connect directly to compute uh, layer of the cluster and they have nothing to do with the storage. So process is running in compute layer, they communicate with the storage using simple API like write the blob by the ID or read the blob by the ID. Compute layer knows nothing about the copies, about the redundancy, about hard disk drives. And the third layer is the application itself. Uh, why it uh, has something to do with WDB? since it's application. Because we provide SDK for most of the popular programming languages that hide the complexity of dealing with distributed system. Uh, you can add new compute nodes to your database. SDK uh, will handle this modification and will connect to new nodes. Uh, different errors might occur when you're sending a query to a distributed system. One node might fail and uh, you have to retry the request. In order to get this burden uh, off the developer, we have retriers, uh, we have uh, client discovery in SDK. It's very uh, convenient to use SDK to communicate with the database cluster. So we have three layers. Storage layer, which is responsible for redundancy of the data. Compute layer, which is responsible for query uh, execution. And SDK, which is responsible for communicating with this distributed cluster. Uh, this is the picture I'm proud of because it was pretty hard to explain how storage is working. Now we can do this. Uh, so let's take a look how storage allows to survive data center outage. Uh, the minimum installation of YDB cluster requires three physical servers of three virtual machines. It doesn't matter. Uh, one server should be located in uh, a data center if you want to deploy YDB in three different data centers, you can set one server in one data center, attach three storage devices to every storage server, and uh, you are uh, done. So this setup will survive uh, complete AZ failure and will still remain read and write available. Even if one uh, drive fails in the remaining data centers, it still will be read and write available so it will not go to read-only mode, it will uh, keep the uh, availability. How do we do this? We do this by dividing physical devices into virtual devices. If you see these rectangles with uh, round corners in different colors, are they in different colors? They are in different colors. Uh, these are virtual disks launched on top of physical disks. Uh, so it requires nine uh, virtual disks to create a storage group. Uh, one uh, virtual disk on a physical disk. Storage group uh, allows to share, fairly share bandwidth of the underlying device and fairly share the uh, size of the underlying device because it's pretty hard to sell whole NVMe of the modern several terabytes to a customer. You won't find a lot of customers requiring so, many, so, so much space. So we uh, share uh, fairly the throughput and the uh, space. Uh, how does it work? I mean, nine rectangles, how they provide read and write availability. Compute node sends a request to blob storage, write uh, to distributed storage. Uh, it was previously called blob storage, so I have to remember. Okay, compute node sends a write request to the distributed storage group, uh, and uh, compute node doesn't have to know anything about copies and all this. Distributed storage group uh, gets the blob identifier and chooses three virtual disks on which it has to save the uh, blob and saves three copies. If three copies are saved, uh, blob, uh, distributed storage group confirms the write operation to the 
compute node, and it's okay. Only after the data is saved on physical devices, not in caches, not in anywhere else, only after it's uh, physically written. In case of a failure, distributed storage group chooses uh, this, considers this data center to be failed, and it chooses uh, another two devices uh, to write four copies. So it writes four copies, and only after that, uh, this write operation is considered to be uh, complete. When you need to write a blob, you send a request to blob storage, read the blob by this identifier. Uh, distributed storage group sends a request to all the virtual disks uh, that keep the copy of the blob, and the fastest uh, response is considered to be uh, enough. So you can save on um, cross data center latency. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Uh, how do you make the data consistent? In in in. Uh, I mean, what kind of replication protocol are you using, or something like that? Pax, Paxos, Raft, or something similar? Um, is um, well, it's a it's a complex question. It's some sort of a uh, in in this particular situation. Uh, why the, um, the consistency is, uh, th there is some sort of synchronization between these virtual disks. Mm -hmm. uh, every virtual disk uh, has a table uh, where blobs uh, which this disk is responsible for are listed, and all of the blobs that its neighbors are responsible for are listed. So you need to get the majority uh, to understand uh, uh, which v, v disk is responsible for which blobs. But in the case, but this is required only uh, at synchronization and uh, at discovery. At the reading, at write operation, it's not uh, required because you just send the right command, and when they are written, they are confirmed. So the uh, idea to check uh, this table is required when you add a new uh, physical storage device. Empty the disks are launched there. They go to uh, blobs. Uh, there's a tablet which holds all this database. Uh, it's called Blob Storage Controller. It sends the information to these VDisks which blobs they are responsible for, and they start collecting the information from their neighbors. Okay, okay. So it's some sort of a Paxos, but I can, it's, it's modified. It's, it's not uh, the consensus algorithm uh, written from uh, the books. Uh, Right, 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 right. And can I ask one more, please? Yeah, 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 sure. Uh, the compute node. Uh, the compute node. Does it know about all of the storage nodes? No. Or is there some kind of a proxy in it? What What does actually it calls? Uh, there's an instance of a C++ class called distributed uh, storage proxy, which okay. runs in compute node. Okay. And uh, you have this DS proxy for every storage group this compute node operates with. So the, the distributed storage proxy knows about the virtual disks, it knows uh, where nodes are located, but uh, when you program the logic of this tablet, which is responsible for rows, it has nothing, it has known nothing about the physical structure of the cluster. Right, okay, okay, okay. thank you. So as to the compute layer, Compute node can run on any node of a cluster. So you can just launch a new YDB process, uh, tell it the balancer of the storage nodes, and uh, the database name it should work with. Uh, and this node is launched and is available. Um, uh, since we operate large clusters of thousands of nodes, we have to divide the compute power somehow, and we have to isolate users from one another. So we introduce the concept of databases. You can run create database command, uh, and uh, when you launch um, compute node, it serves only one database. Uh, you cannot share one node between several databases. So the compute power assigned to a compute node, for instance, virtual machine or a Kubernetes port, uh, completely dedicated to one database. And you can scale this compute power independently from storage. In order to add more space to the database, you add storage group. In order to add more processing resources, you can add more virtual machines. Uh, in case of a failure of compute node, it could be relaunched on any other node. We can use instance groups uh, when we run this in a cloud, or we can use Kubernetes operator. 
Uh, the only thing you have to keep in mind when you are restarting compute nodes of the database is that you've got to keep enough compute resources in order to handle all the requests coming to this database. So you cannot shut down all the nodes because then there will be no nodes to serve the uh, requests. Uh, when you restart a compute node, uh, it causes transient errors because in order to answer a query, there should be a tablet responsible for the key range served by this uh, tablet running. And when you restart the compute node, uh, these tablets are not running all the time because there should be uh, taken some time in order to relaunch the tablets on another node, and you can get the uh, errors to the responses until the tablets are relaunched. Um, so let's get back to the challenges we have identified with the rolling update and uh, try to figure out how can WayDB and its layered architecture help us to solve this. We need to keep read and write availability, so we should not restart more than uh, one data center of the storage, uh, and we should not restart more compute nodes um, to, uh, that, that is required to handle the uh, requests, and we need to minimize error rates and uh, latency degradation. Uh, how can we restore it? storage? We can do a simple thing. We can write a bash script, uh, list all the storage servers, and restart them one by one. Or we have only three of them. It shouldn't be a hard task. So we should just look at this. Now they are restarted. That's OK. We can tolerate the restart of one server at, at a time. No problem. <clears throat> but if you are running a cluster of uh, thousands of nodes, this approach might be uh, tricky because it's too long. Or uh, you don't know which nodes are online. Maybe one node was offline for maintenance. Someone decided to re replace the disk. Uh, or you have to make sure when the node is restarted, it's healthy and it's uh, safe to restart the next node. So this bash script might become pretty large, tracking health status and things like this. So we had a distributed system which can run tablets, and we decided to use this uh, infrastructure to write a new tablet, cluster management system, which would um, allow us to restart the storage nodes. And we have a simple rolling restart tool which communicates with this API. Uh, this rolling restart tool sends the request for restarting all the storage. Cluster management system knows which uh, uh, storage nodes exist in a cluster and returns uh, the token for this operation and the list of all nodes to the rolling restart tool. Rolling restart, restart tool sends the request to restart all the nodes, just it doesn't think a lot, and then cluster management system figures out which nodes are safe to restart right now. And it returns a list of nodes to restart. There are some settings uh, so you can speed up the process or slow it down in order to minimize the influence on the latency. So it's all operated in cluster management system. Then rolling restart gets all this list of nodes, SSHs to every node, uh, in parallel restarts them, waits for some time out, and then uh, iterates to get the new list of nodes. If nodes that were restarted didn't, uh, didn't work well on a newer version, CMS doesn't allow to restart new nodes, the process stalls, and the operator is notified in order to uh, do something. And the cluster is still read and write available, so in this situation, clients uh, don't see any uh, degradations in operations. And the token is required in order to continue the process if virtual machine you are running this tool uh, fails. As to the compute, we identified that you cannot uh, restart more than uh, allowed amount of nodes in order to handle all the requests. So rolling restart tool does the same thing. It requests, uh, uh, and one more thing, uh, you can restart many databases simultaneously because they are independent and you don't have to iterate uh, on the list of databases. So rolling restart tool gets the task, restart all compute nodes of the cluster, goes to a cluster management system, uh, receives the list of all the nodes of a cluster with a token, and then sends the request to restart, restart all these nodes at once. Cluster management system selects the node, nodes that are safe to restart, 
and uh, returns them to the restart tool. Uh, in order to survive data center failure, uh, we over provision compute. Uh, so we always keep in mind that one data center might go down, and uh, we have to uh, over provision up to 40% uh, of compute power uh, in order to uh, instantly handle all this load when a data center fails. It might sound expensive, but if you trade, you, you can trade it. So if you want to be available in case of a data center failure, you just uh, choose over provisioning. Or you can do not do this, but then you have to uh, risk the situation that your computer is overloaded when one data center fails and you have to do something. Uh, so we used uh, WayDB infrastructure, uh, which allows us to run tablets uh, um, uh, on a distributed system and store information in a cluster reliably uh, in order to operate rolling restart and do all the complexity of managing hard distributed system. And we can use a small rolling restart tool written in Go in order to use this uh, cluster management system API and orchestrate the restart. Uh, but can we do better? So this looks pretty fine, but can we do better? What happens when a compute node restarts? Let's consider a simple situation when you have to send a query and write a row by, its, by, by the value of its primary key. Application sends a request to one of the compute nodes of the database. Uh, let's think that the tablet responsible for the row uh, with this primary key is running on another node of a cluster. System internally routes the request to this compute node. This tablet does uh, send the request to the blob storage, and then it's restarted. So all the system answers the application with the unavailable uh, code. Uh, application can resend the request, so it's retriable since it's uh, important, but uh, you still will get this error. You and, you will, and you will either trade the latency uh, of the uh, response or the error rate. <clears throat> uh, beyond uh, these unavailable errors, you have applications. Applications use SDK, and SDK establishes connections to all the compute nodes of the cluster to send the, uh, not the cluster of the database, sorry. Uh, so application establishes uh, connections to all the nodes of the database in order to utilize compute power, in order to route requests to different data centers. So it's convenient. And when one compute node fails, application uh, sees the uh, disconnection error, or it sees the bad session error because it establishes gRPC session, and uh, it might uh, not notice that the node is down, send the request, and get the bad session response. So when compute nodes are restarted, uh, SDK gets increased amount of bad session errors. This uh, brings us to the situation when you have uh, more unavailable errors and more bad session errors during the rolling restart. So we decided to implement the evacuation. This rolling restart tool uh, sends the command for node to restart. Node handles the system signal and uh, tells all the tablets that they have to move somewhere. The automation inside the cluster sees that uh, tablet, there should be like 100 tablets running, one is not responding, so it should be uh, launched on another compute node. The compute node is chosen, the tablet is started. So this process uh, completes at once, and now we can safely restart the, this node. You can control the in-flight of the tablets being evacuated, uh, and this is how you can trade the spike in an available error when compute node goes down to the duration of the uh, small error rate. So you can uh, crawl underneath the alerts of your uh, customers if they monitor the increase of uh, error rates. When this node is restarted, uh, the automation uh, might consider rebalancing the tablets to the new empty compute node. Since we control the SDK, we decided to add a new uh, header, and it works almost like uh, with the tablets evacuation. The restarting tool sends the signal to the compute node. 
uh, compute node uh, starts responding with the special header that it's going to be shut down soon. And SDK closes all the sessions to this node and reestablishes sessions to the other nodes. And uh, the node also doesn't allow to create new session because it's going to be restarted soon. When the node is back, uh, when the node is back, uh, SDK periodically discovers the nodes which are serving this database, and it knows that the node is back. It establishes the connection to the new node of the cluster. So this is how we solved the challenges uh, which are caused by a rolling restart. A cluster management system allows us to track the availability of the storage groups, so we cannot uh, restart too many servers to go system beyond the availability model. Uh, CMS also allows us to track the availability of compute power, compute resources, and doesn't allow us to restart too many compute nodes. Uh, and uh, assist, uh, sessions and tablet evacuation allows us to minimize the error rate and latency degradation uh, because we gracefully evacuate um, sessions and tablets from the nodes. <laughs> Though our system exists from 2014, we still didn't uh, finish the development. Luckily, we still have a job. And uh, we figured that uh, customers don't like uh, custom SQL languages. They want to use Postgres. They don't Postgres, they want to use Postgres. Besides SQL, they want to use their applications, which know how to talk to Postgres using, using PGWire. So this fall, we are going to announce a complete Postgres compatibility, like our competitors Cockroach does, like Google Spanner does. So I hope it will be possible to use Postgres libraries with WayDB. Um, some people like WayDB because they can move their OLTP transactional loads to a new system, which is distributed, scalable, and they like it. But they don't want to migrate data to another storage to run analytics. So we have a lot of requests to provide analytics. And now we are going to introduce this full column organized tables and uh, all up so people can do analytical processing and stop uh, running um, different uh, systems that allow analytics outside OADB. Despite, uh, uh, beyond, be <laughs> besides, <laughs> besides C++ development, we also believe in Kubernetes because it's hard to deploy all the systems with uh, legacy tools we have developed internally. We have a Kubernetes operator which allows to operate a stateful distributed system. It's written in Go. Uh, I hope it's also open sourced. And we are improving this operator all the time in order to use only one uh, deployment uh, tool. Uh, YDB is available in uh, Nibius Cloud. It's a sort of a cloud run in Israel. Uh, it's in technical preview currently. You can use it uh, for free. You can Google Nibius Cloud and try YDB in serverless or in a dedicated mode. Or you can discover uh, deployment options for on-premise on our website with documentation. Uh, it's easy to try YDB. Not always, but it should be. Uh, thank you very much. That's all I was going to talk about. Thank you very much for the interesting talk. Are there any more questions for him? Yes? Perfect. Um, the uh, SDK you talked about, uh, which uh, like distributes requests, uh, is it also running on every node or is it like a separate service running on an instance where you talk to or the, are there multiple endpoints? SDK is the library which you use for your favorite programming language, for instance, Python. Uh, and you, like in SQL Alchemy, we have a plugin for SQL Alchemy, by the way, uh, and you can send SQL queries to the YDB using this uh, Python library. So it's running on your application, and uh, it depends wh when you, where you want to deploy your application to.
Anybody else have some questions? No? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for the talk. Thank you.